Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at Morphe's taking a look at a Spitfire carbine. Now, these were originally manufactured as semi-automatic only open bolt 45 caliber carbines. They were intended to be sort of a poor man's Thompson gun. Uh, and I should point out, this one has been modified a bit. This barrel shroud has been added as they were originally manufactured. They had a bit longer of a barrel with fins, no barrel shroud, and looked very much like a Thompson barrel. Along with, of course, Thompson rear sights, a vaguely Thompson-like grip, Thompson buttstock, and so on. The idea was, well, you can't afford a, a real high-quality Thompson gun, but you can afford a Spitfire. Now, what makes this gun interesting, aside from a sort of can't-help-but-stare-at-a-train-wreck style of machining on the lower, which we'll get to in a moment, which is interesting, uh, what makes these really uh, relevant in firearms history is that this is one of the specific guns that is in part responsible for the commonly held notion in the US that semi-automatic open bolt guns are illegal. Uh, I've been guilty of perpetuating this myself, and I'm indebted to Matt LaRossier over at Fudbusters for enlightening, as to, enlightening me as to what the actual legal status of the question is, because open bolt semi-automatic firearms are not, in fact, banned in any de facto or in any specific way. There are a couple of specific examples of semi-auto open bolt guns that have been heavily regulated, and everyone sort of has just then assumed that that applies to any open bolt semi-auto. So I thought it'd be really cool to take a look at a Spitfire here and explain why this got determined, not by ATF, but actually by the Attorney General in 1968 to be a machine gun and not a semi-auto rifle. So let's take a closer look at it. The poor man's Thompson gun here. Uh, this was actually developed to run on grease gun mags, which are a lot easier to work with than Thompson mags. Uh, not really much going on there, just a 30 round grease gun mag. 45 ACP caliber, of course. The buttstock is an actual Thompson buttstock, so I can push the button and take that off. It is worth pointing out uh, on the Thompson, there's a little notch on the back of the receiver that this latches into. On the Spitfire, the notch is actually the slot in the rear takedown screw here. So that locks into the screw. So when you reassemble the gun, you have to make sure that the screw is lined up with that uh, notch horizontal, or else the stock won't lock into place. As I said at the beginning, when these were originally manufactured, they had a much more Thompson-like front end. They had 16-inch barrels in order to comply with the NFA. Uh, because this thing was deemed a machine gun and registered as such, I should point that out, this is a registered transferable machine gun, uh, because it's a machine gun, barrel length is no longer... doesn't matter. And so at some point one of the owners both put on this barrel shroud and also cut the barrel down to about 10 inches, uh, just to make it handier. Uh, makes sense, since barrel length doesn't matter on a machine gun. That said, there's certainly nothing that inspires confidence so much as a gun held together by big socket head screws, right? Uh, let's go ahead and... Oh, actually, before we take it apart, let me point out that mechanically, while this looks like a Thompson, mechanically it's essentially based on a grease gun. And there is no cocking handle, because like a grease gun you cock it by reaching your finger in there and pulling the bolt back manually. So. This normally would look like a gun that has malfunctioned and not gone fully into battery. In this case, that's how it's actually supposed to look. There's a long stem on the bolt, and it deliberately stops with about that much space, so you have a place to get your fingers in there to cock it. The other thing that I want to point out regarding this having been registered as a machine gun is that someone has also, probably the same person, gone in and modified the fire control group to actually work like a machine gun. So if I hold the trigger down, the bolt is just going to cycle until I release the trigger. Uh, and as originally manufactured, that was not the case. The way they were originally made, it was one shot, and it would go bang, and open up, eject the empty case, and recock itself. What made this a machine gun was the safety right here. And the reason that it was deemed a machine gun was if you pulled the safety down while you were pulling the trigger, it would just fire full auto. Um, by the way, the safety does work if you pull it down, the gun's on safe. 
But if you pull the trigger and then pull the safety down, you get full auto on an allegedly semi-auto Spitfire. So let's pull the lower off and see why. The rear end cap here is under spring tension, so if you're going to take one of these apart, make sure that uh, you've got the bolt forward, and then hold on to the end cap when you're taking this screw out. There we go, that comes out, and then our lower comes off and has kind of fallen slightly apart. There we go, we'll take a look at this in just a moment. The internal mechanism here is very simple. We have two guide rods with their guide rod springs, like a grease gun. And then I can pull out the bolt, which basically has nothing going on here. It's got a fixed firing pin, You've got the two holes for the guide rods. You're going to run through it like that. That's the, the slot, or the notch right there, that the sear locks onto. And that's pretty much it. The receiver tube is just a tube. It's got an ejector welded in there. It actually has the original style of Lyman rear sight from a Thompson, which is nuts. Like, that sight is terrible. But now the fire control system. So the way this is supposed to work, we've got our sear here, we've got a disconnector here. So when I fire, I'm going to pull the sear down like this. That lets the bolt go forward. The bolt's going to hit this disconnector, which is going to pop the sear back up, hence making it semi-auto. Now, as I mentioned, this one has been modified so that the disconnector doesn't actually do that. Because it's registered as a machine gun, you might as well actually just get normal machine gun firing. All right, now the safety is right there, and when I pull the lever down, the safety goes forward. And what's supposed to happen is, once the safety is forward, the sear can't drop far enough to release the bolt. And it does, it works. However, if I have the safety disengaged, I pull the sear down, and then I pull the safety down, the safety comes forward and is pressing on the sear, and just through friction holds it down. So when I release the safety, the sear pops up. This is what got the gun determined to be a machine gun, because you could essentially, without any modifications, you could, you could bypass the disconnector by just using the safety right there. Notice I've let go of the trigger, I'm just using the safety to hold the sear down. When I release the safety, then the sear pops back up. So it is not the semi-auto open bolt functionality of this gun that was responsible for it being uh, essentially prohibited. Not strictly speaking prohibited, but deemed a machine gun. Uh, examples of this had to be registered. So these guns could be registered. They could also uh, be registered in the amnesty that followed very shortly in 1968. Um, the letter, by the way, uh, making this determination was from 1968. So. Uh, what got these things declared machine guns is, is, again, not the open bolt function, but rather the effective function of the safety allowing you to have full auto without any modification whatsoever to the gun. Since we didn't look at them before, here are the markings on the front, 45 cal, specifically marked semi-auto, and it is serialized. Uh, for ATF's purposes, it is this lower assembly that is considered the machine gun, so there are no markings on the upper tube. Um, they're registered with the manufacturer's marks down here and that serial number. Uh, because these were originally sold as semi-autos, it is possible that you may run into one somewhere still on the semi-auto market. There's nothing necessarily about this gun that would tell someone who didn't otherwise know that it was a machine gun. And they are in fact marked semi-auto. Even after they've been registered, they still have that semi-auto marking on them. So, if you do run into one of these at a gun show or something, do be aware that if it is not registered, it is considered an illegal machine gun by the feds, with all of the potential penalties associated with that. It's really kind of ironic to me that the, the thing that got this gun in trouble is, at the same time, the thing that has made it fantastically more valuable today than it would have been otherwise. Because as a registered transferable machine gun, Regardless of the quality of its original manufacturer, this thing is worth thousands of dollars compared to the guns that are very much like it, uh, that the same company came out with in the aftermath of this one being declared a machine gun. Guns like the Volunteer carbines and the Apache carbines. 
which remain semi-auto only and are really very niche sort of guns that only appeal to a limited number of people because they are semi-auto, uh, they have the same level of machining and fabrication quality, and they aren't machine guns. So all the controversy... I mean, it would have been nice, I suppose, for Spitfire manufacturing if they actually still owned a bunch of these. They don't actually have any way to profit, or didn't have any real way to profit from their guns being declared machine guns, but it has certainly made them valuable guns today. Anyway, uh, that's just a, an interesting look, I think, into some of the vagarities of American machine gun regulatory law. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Once again, thanks to Matt LaRossier over at Fudbusters uh, for clearing up my misconception, and I think a great many other people's misconception, about uh, the legal status of open bolt semi-autos. He has a video on the subject, which I will link to in the end cards of this one, if you're interested in getting a little more detail and a lawyer's point of view on that. Thanks for watching.